Oh wow, Pegasus Dragon, what a wonderful creature that might be. Is it a magnificent horse with draconic wings and an impressive maw? Is it a beautiful white dragon with feathery wings and an equine mane? It must be awe-inspiring. Well, dear viewer, it is an impressive little beast. Truly one of a kind and perhaps the single most unique imaginary being I have or will ever cover. Yet, it is not a breathtaking appearance that makes it so. The exceptional conditions around its conception and the mayfly lifespan it had are the main culprits. I hope I made you sufficiently curious about what the Pegasus Dragon actually is, and allow me to completely subvert any expectations you might have had. Unless the thumbnail gives it away too much, but there is no way for me to know that as I write or record this. Alas, let's not waste any more time. The Pegasus Dragon is a small little fish, somewhere around 10 cm. It has a snout with a sturgeon-like mouth underneath. The body is flat and clad in a knightly armor with small radiated plates. The animal also has a tail not unlike that of a crocodile. It has expansive fins that enable it to soar like a flying fish. Quite a unique look, I must say. Could it be real? Well, yes and no. Here comes the complication. This creature has only ever been mentioned a single time. James William Buell completed one of his books in 1887 called Sea and Land. It includes a wide variety of topics discussing natural history of both land and sea animals. The book dances on the fine line between fact and fiction and in a few occasions discusses imaginary creatures, misidentifies existing animals or simply adds extra traits to others. The Pegasus Dragon is somewhere between the first and the second. This is the whole extent the enormous collection of pages spare for this interesting fish. However, the description is not that accurate. In fact, there is a drawing earlier in the book, which is the reason we know he wasn't just spinning tall tales. This image is recognizably a little dragonfish which lives in the Indo-Pacific and was actually known way before Beagle made his discovery. Unfortunately. Yes, unfortunately. This animal, along with other members of its family, are mass murdered in an industrial manner. You see, they are used in Chinese medicine. Truly a death sentence. I know there's a lot of despicable shit going on in that country, but their traditional medicine has to be one of the most frustrating aspects, as it is so deeply rooted in their culture that there is almost no hope it will ever stop. All it does is make charlatans richer and gullible misinformed people poorer while massacring helpless animals at an unfathomable rate. Even thinking about it pisses me off. Pangolins are some of my favorite animals. Now look at this image. This is the main reason I have trouble reading Chinese beast series. Almost every creature, no matter how impossible, has some part you can cut off and use as medicine or a charm. Alright, alright, I'm done with the tangent. Where was I? Oh yes, the little dragonfish. Well, not all people who knew of its existence started murdering it. In fact, a member of this family, the long-tailed seamouth, was identified way before the publishing of the book, as far back as 1758. However, it seems Buell was not ignorant as the animal he identified was originally called Pegasus Draconis, or Pegasus Dragon in Latin. For what reason did he use a mirror translation is unclear, but in some aspects he was right. The little dragonfish does have armor-like plates covering it, which it sheds in a single piece. Its mouth is indeed similar to that of a suckerfish as it sucks worms and other small animals out of their hiding place while forming a tube. However, it cannot fly. The fins are shaped in such a way to help it walk across the seabed. This is all well and good, a mistake made in the identification of the animal or maybe some translation mishap with a bit of edit flair. Does this not mean that the Pegasus Dragon is not an imaginary beast? Well. Again, yes and no. The term Pegasus Dragon was only ever used in this book and the English name for these fish collectively is Seamoth. This paired with the added flying ability and Buell's tendency to include both real and fictional creatures in his work makes it really stand out. As I've said, a very unique case. It's not a folklore creature, it was hardly ever held as a cryptid as it was technically identified prior to its creation, but it's not quite a real animal either, especially if we go by the description. It's like the camelopard. Sure, it's just a giraffe, but is it really? 
Even if you come to the conclusion that the Pegasus dragon is not really fit for a bestiary of imaginary animals, it's still one interesting story, isn't it? Sea moths are rather cute too. They are also popular aquarium animals, however, if there is anything at all you take away from this video, please do not buy any of them, do not kidnap them from their natural habitats as it is a major threat they face, putting their very future in jeopardy. Also, don't snore their dried husks or whatever it is the Chinese do with them, your penis won't get bigger. Regardless, I have one more treat for you. While reading this description for the first time without looking at the image, I associated the Pegasus Dragon with something entirely different, which gave me quite an idea. Since the second half in each episode of this series is spent creating a realistic version of the monster I dissect in the first, I'd have little to do in this case. Let's disregard the drawing for now though. What I aim to do is to only take the description and make an armored fish that can truly fly. So, what is that mysterious animal I associated the Pegasus Dragon with? Pteraspidomorphy. This is an extinct class of ancient jawless fish. As you can see on the images, they had quite unique features, ones we cannot really find in modern animals. Their bodies were well armored, with large plates covering most of it. Some had snout-like protrusions too. Just look at these Larnovaspis models. The tails are not far from crocodilian ones either, especially if you consider images like these. A promising start, isn't it? We do run into some problems though, they lack pectoral fins for one. Also, Pteraspidomorphy only existed between the fourth quarter of the Cambrian to the late Devonian, since it is unclear whether they can be considered the ancestors of jawed fish, we cannot be sure if their descendants evolved some or not. Let's not forget the fact that they are supposed to be capable of flight too. This might seem a daunting list, but we do have the fundamentals down, and working with an extinct class, we have relative liberty. You see, these creatures have not really been around for the past 360 million years or so. This gives us plenty of leeway in designing a fictional descendant of theirs. They can remain jawless, as feeding through sucking is consistent with the dragonfish. They all have to be smaller though, as the 10cm criteria of the Pegasus dragon is significantly lower than the average size of Teraspidomorphy. This does come in handy though, as a light body would take flight a lot easier. So, let's take this slightly modified Teraspidomorph and make it evolve pectoral fins. This is kind of a leap, but they'd have serious trouble keeping up with modern sea life using nothing but their tail. While we are at it, let's add some ventral ones too. Why? Well, I'm just following the general design of actual flying fish. Since Buell thought his Pegasus dragon was a mixture of seahorses and flying fish, this is kind of a necessity, as no other form would allow them to achieve the same ability. With the final stroke, I'd hazard another modification to their size and say that 10 cm is the low end for our made up Pegasus dragon. I do not really want to stray too far from the size of flying fish for a couple of reasons. Firstly, a smaller size might not give it the strength necessary to propel itself as efficiently over the waves. Secondly, if we go overboard, the added weight of the armor plates might be too much. All in all, a comfortable 10 to 15 cm range would suffice, I think. Well, this was easy. I do not think I've ever created a fictional animal this quick, with so few difficulties. Hang on a second, there is a flow in this design, isn't there? The Pegasus dragon feeds on the seabed, why would it ever be in a position where it has to fly? Alright, let's put on the thinking hat, this is still salvageable. Coral reefs. Pegasus dragons would find plenty of food here and flight might still be a viable option. Alright, uh, now we have a different problem. There's an overload of defensive mechanisms. The coral reef enables hiding, the armor protects the animal from attacks, while flying is also an option. It would surely not be practical to have all these abilities, would it? By the way, you can see I'm a professional because I include my own doubts. Well, I'd say this would cover all bases, but not necessarily overlap. Sure, there is hiding from large predators, but the reefs hold many ambushers. Something like a moor eagle striking at our poor dragon would kill it in an instant. Unless the most important organs are hidden behind a nigh impenetrable suit of plates. 
Alright, that's two, but what about the elephant in the room? I'd say there are plenty of scenarios where hiding is not an option and armor would not be enough. Flying would burn a lot of calories and by its nature, who knows where the Pegasus Dragon would end up, therefore it is a last resort. Still, it is an option and beside the large fins there aren't many drawbacks to having it. At any rate, it's a plausible animal, not a very likely one, but there are stranger things out there. So there you have it, the final results. I think I've addressed all the crucial features and this Pegasus Dragon is oddly cute. Now I'll do an awkward outro as usual. Or maybe I won't.